Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Wednesday, everybody. One quick update before the main stories, and there is another thunderstorm today as of the filming of this. So my apologies if you can hear a little bit of the thunder in the background. This week, the president of Indonesia is meeting with General Secretary Xi Jinping in Beijing. Indonesia is hosting the G20 meeting in Bali later this year, and no doubt Beijing would like a friendly host, as many of the other guest nations will not be. Business was also a key topic with the Belt and Road Initiative, Jakarta Bandung High Speed Rail Network, and Regional Comprehensive Economic Corridor discussed. During the trip, the U.S. sent a military general to Indonesia to discuss, among other things, counterbalancing China in the South China Sea. The Indonesian president is the first head of state China has hosted since the Beijing Winter Olympic Games, and that last leader. Was Vladimir Putin. Now, also one small housekeeping matter. In recent days, several people have come to me and said that、uh, they have been unsubscribed to this channel, China Update. Looking at the data on my side, it does seem like a lot of channels have been unsubscribed. Now, I don't know why YouTube is doing this, but if you do regularly watch China Update and you want to continue watching, maybe take this opportunity just to check to make sure that you're still subscribed to the channel. Okay, first up, the Chinese economy. The International Monetary Fund updated its world economic outlook yesterday, which included a cut to its global growth forecast for this year and next year, as well as a large cut to Chinese growth. The international body warned with the update that the world economy is on the cusp of an outright recession. The IMF cut its global forecast to 3.2 percent this year, from its 3.6 percent forecast in April, and. 4.4% forecast in January. The fund reduced the projection for Chinese expansion to 3.3% from 4.4%, citing China's deepening property crisis, zero COVID restrictions, and reduced global demand for exports. 3.3% is lower than the 4% that many China-focused economists are forecasting for 2022. Though Q2 this year in China was devastating, Q1 was firm, and expensive large-scale stimulus will see unhealthy but real growth rebound in Q3. Of course, both these are far below the 5.5% growth target set by the government at the start of this year. However, even Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang have both admitted, albeit implicitly, that this target is not achievable this year. And Chinese financial outlet Yitai writes that China may need to use its 2023 special bond quota early in order to hit politically acceptable GDP growth targets. Indeed, the chief analyst at Cinda Securities (CINDA) Securities told clients this week that China will need this kind of expansionary fiscal policy to achieve more than 4% growth this year. As we discussed a few days ago, most of this year's special bond quota, usually used by local governments to build infrastructure to meet growth and employment targets, has already been used. 93%, 3.4 trillion RMB, approximately half a trillion US dollars, of this year's quota was used by the end of June. Two thirds of the special bonds sold went towards infrastructure. The Cinda Securities chief analyst argues that the early use of next year's quota would be a reasonable measure to support the economy because China will likely be in a stronger position next year, and thus will be less likely to need as many special bonds. This is quite an assumption, especially with the IMF warning of global recession and several domestic economic crises. Like the housing crisis, which policymakers are still grappling with, we also recall several similar optimistic predictions from 2021 about a strong 2022. Some analysts have pushed back against the early use of next year's quota. Quote, It generally isn't a good strategy to make up for current weakness by assuming excess strength in the future. And on that basis, moving some of the growth forward, Chinese growth is slowing permanently, and any recovery this year or next will just be a partial reversal of this year's terrible performance. The sooner they acknowledge this, the better. End quote. 
Hey guys, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to hit the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help me keep trying to update sustainable, it's just me making these episodes for you guys every day. Uh, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. Over the weekend, China successfully launched its second module to the Tiangong Space Station. The module took off aboard a Long March 5B rocket from a launch station in southern Hainan province, docking at the space station about 13 hours later. The module provides three extra spaces to sleep, as well as equipment to perform various scientific experiments on the space station. Some experts are concerned about where the 23-ton long March B-5 rocket will land as it returns to Earth. According to the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology this week, China also plans to launch a large space telescope next year to fly alongside the Tiangong Space Station. The Academy said that a Long March 5B will deploy the telescope in a low Earth orbit. The telescope will, quote, carry out deep space observation and research in the frontier fields of science, end quote. Okay, next up in the big news in US-China relations remains Taiwan and the planned Pelosi trip. The PRC continues with their warnings against the trip in private and publicly. Yesterday at a press event, a spokesperson for the Chinese military expressed, quote, if Speaker Pelosi visits Taiwan, it would seriously violate the One China Principle, and the stipulations in the three China-US joint communiques seriously harm China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and seriously damage the political foundation of China-US relations. End quote. State-run Global Times, in an article unpacking the statement, writes that the remarks, quote, indicate that PLA is fully prepared for all responses if she does visit the island, end quote, and express that the Chinese military should, quote, declare the entire Taiwan island as PLA's drill zone, intercepting all unauthorized planes flying in the zone if Pelosi visits the island, end quote. Politburo Standing Committee member Wang Yang made a special speech during a meeting marking the 30th anniversary of the so-called 1992 consensus between Taipei and Beijing. State media writes that he, quote, called on Taiwan compatriots to gain a deep understanding of the benefits of reunification, as well as the fact that Taiwan independence leads to a dead end and that outsiders are not reliable, end quote. The 1992 consensus is often pointed to as the mechanism or the platform for creating a diplomatic basis for semi-official cross-strait exchanges starting from the early 1990s. The problem is, there doesn't seem to be much consensus regarding what this consensus is. The PRC's position is that there is just one China, which includes Taiwan, of which the People's Republic of China, with its capital in Beijing, is the only legitimate representative. Taiwan's KMT party's position is that there is one China, but Taipei and Beijing disagree about what China means. Taiwan's DPP party simply rejects that any consensus exists. Meanwhile, Pelosi's Taiwan trip is beginning to morph into a domestic political matter in the United States, as domestic political calculus typically trumps geostrategic considerations. This may make it much harder for her to postpone or cancel the trip. Some Republicans are even supporting Pelosi's trip too, including a conservative senator, at least two former Trump administration officials, and the last Speaker of the House to make the trip to Taiwan, Newt Gingrich. All have expressed that the Biden White House should back the trip, with Gingrich expressing in an interview yesterday, quote, We need to be very, very clear, and this is part of why we had a lot of tension in 1996-97. And President Clinton and I collaborated in trying to send a very strong signal, including putting American aircraft carriers in the Taiwan Strait. So I would say she absolutely has to go now. End quote. However, some US commentators have also asked, what exactly is the game plan here? Quote, the uncomfortable question has to be asked, what precisely is Pelosi hoping to achieve? 
Her intention to demonstrate support for Taiwan is obvious, but her activities do not appear linked to any broader American strategy, such as drawing U.S. allies in the region into closer coordination to deal with the threat from China, or encouraging Taiwan to improve its own defense capabilities, or drawing on lessons from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As the messy messaging from the White House has shown, there appears to be little communication or coordination here. Unlike her appearance in Tiananmen Square in 1991, however, which left a few reporters roughed up and detained, if the situation escalates now, it will be the people of Taiwan, and potentially any American service members flying her there, who will be left to face the consequences. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.